Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. I had another video planned for today, but then I realized how close we are to the release of The Incredibles 2. So I wanted to talk about the anticipation for that film and speak to what made the original Incredibles such a classic. I have heard people reacting to the trailer for The Incredibles 2 with some trepidation, and I understand that completely. The fear is that this is just another film in this day and age that's going to be riddled with the SJW politics. You've got the woman, Elastigirl's out there doing the hero work by herself because she's strong and she's a woman. And the man, we're going to throw him at home with the kids because, yeah, serves those men right and so forth. I, I get that. I do. I don't share that fear in this case, though. I'm going to keep a cautious eye out. And if, if I'm wrong, I'm definitely going to come back and report on that because great storytellers are betraying us left and right with films or comics or whatever that completely lack in story quality and are just beefed up with virtue signaling and the political agendas. But I'm not too worried about The Incredibles 2 for two reasons. One is Brad Bird. Brad Bird is a quality storyteller. He's done some amazing work, even work that did touch on some social and political issues. I did not see Tomorrowland. Some people have told me that that one moved too far into the political scape. I haven't seen that, so I can't speak to that. And certainly, wonderful storytellers have betrayed us, like I said. So just my trust in Brad Bird isn't enough. The other reason, though, I'm not too worried about this film yet is because I see, from the trailer anyway, I see this angle on the story as a natural progression from what the first film dealt with. Now again, I am not defending an empty story that just serves as an SJW platform. Absolutely not. And if this is the case with this Incredibles 2 film, I will be the first to come back and speak out against it. But one of the things that made the first Incredibles film so great was that it spoke to the cultural and social pressures that went on in the time it was set. And spoke to them in a mythological way. So we opened that film in the 40s, and in a way that spoke to us living in the cultural heritage of those times today. So that's pretty vague and abstract, let me be more specific. The film opened in the 40s, and this was the golden age of superheroes. In the real world, this was the golden age of superheroes in comic books. This was the era that they were created and super popular, especially during World War II. Well, have you ever stopped to wonder why? Some reasons that have to do with technology and printing and business and so forth, but the real reason is that this was a time when there was a clear evil present in our world society. The Nazis. And I mean literal Nazis, not just people you disagree with and you want to call Nazis. We had literal, as close to black and white evil as you can get, certainly in a wartime. And there was a need for heroes. There was a need for heroes on the war front, and even in society, you had a clear and present evil in terms of corruption. Law enforcement on a local and federal level was still trying to sort itself out in many ways. You had disenfranchised people, like a lot of the young Jewish men who created some of our greatest heroes, letting forth that anxiety in these great heroes that spoke to them personally, and it spoke to the country nationally. That's the golden age of heroes, and in the film, this is when heroes are accepted, they're popular, they're famous. Then we moved through the 50s and into the early 60s, 1962 in the film, and now superheroes have been outlawed. They're dangerous, and so on, and in the real world... In the 50s, at a certain point, this is when we had the congressional hearings and Dr. Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent. This is when popular opinion was turning against comic books. This was when you tragically had children being organized by their community and church leaders and whatnot to gather their comics together and burn them because they're bad for culture and bad for society, turning all of our young men into Nazis and our young women into lesbians and so forth. It was just a horrifically ridiculous time. And in the film, since it's mythology, it's not a real-life series of events, we have superheroes outlawed having to go undercover. In comic books, our heroes had to abide by the Comics Code Authority, so in a sense, they had to go undercover as well, not deal with so many inflammatory issues, mind some certain P's and Q's for a time. That was the resonance of the film on a superhero level, but even more than that, on a personal level, with the people. In history. In World War II, your average Joe, middle class worker, soldier, whatever, this was a high time. It was a dangerous time. And there was real evil to be fought, just as Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl are fighting real evil villains in the beginning of that film. So there was real evil to be fought, but there was also a, a united front. 
there was a strong sense of shared morals, at least on the surface. Of course, you can go into disenfranchised groups and find all kinds of problems. As I've said, there were problems in the political, local, and federal structures. But your general pop culture was one that embraced the words truth, justice, and the American way. People had important work to do, whether soldiers on the field, whether women in the factories making up for the loss of men, children in the scrapyards gathering metal. There was important work to be done. Then you come into the 50s, early 60s, after the war is won, and this is seen as sort of this golden era. It's certainly an affluent time for your average middle class person. This is the suburban era, and this is where we see Bob and Helen Parr raising their family. But there's a malaise, there's a discontent. We see that Bob's not quite happy with his job, this wonderful high paying job, this, this wonderful house that he lives in with his wonderful family. He's not content because he's not being true to himself. He's not doing the work that he believes he's meant to do. Instead, he's fitting a cultural expectation. He's doing the nine to five job. He's commuting to work, living in the suburbs, living with the family, but he's not happy. He's not fulfilled. And that was a common phenomenon for a lot of middle-class men in the 50s, looking for a way to, to break out of this, to not necessarily stop or leave their family or anything extreme like that, but just a way to feel needed, necessary, to be true to themselves and not just true to societal expectations. And the film resolved that beautifully in a way that brought the family closer together. By the end, they're all the Incredibles together each with their own individual abilities and personalities, but working together. And it was a beautiful film. It just resonated on so many levels with people. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The reason, though, that I'm not too worried about this sequel with Elastigirl going off and being the chosen one to do the hero work in public is that this also mirrors what happened in society next. A lot of women in the 40s who went into the factories, the Rosie the Riveter types who went into the factories to work because the men were all at war, and this was their patriotic duty to go into the factories and, and do the work to help the war effort. Well, when the men came back, the war was won, they were expected to go back into those suburban homes, be the housewives, resume that life, and never step into the other life they had to inhabit temporarily. For many women, that was fine. There's nothing wrong with being a housewife. Don't listen to the feminist propaganda that says, oh, they were all miserable, they all wanted to go off and be lesbians and leave their families or whatever. Ridiculous. And I know that might sound like a straw man, but I've studied and worked in higher academia. I know this extreme third-wave feminist nonsense, and it's very real. That wasn't the case. But you did have discontent. And this is what eventually fed into some of the second-wave feminism that came to a head later in the 60s. I don't know how much later... The Incredibles 2 picks up. It can't be too much later, though, because the children aren't but so aged. But we're moving into the 60s. We're moving toward this era and the more female empowerment and so forth. So it makes sense that that would be the next tension or the next era to tackle within a family dynamic. The Incredibles was all about family. What do you do? Well, if you're going to make a film, if you're going to have conflict, tension, and things to be resolved and overcome and wrapped up, then you can't just have... The Incredibles be one big happy family, not challenged in anything throughout a sequel. They need to face something. And going by social history, this seems like the next logical step. I'll be upset if Elastigirl is just the hero of the film and we hardly ever see the rest of them in uniform, but I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. I think it can still be a great story. Again, I'm going in with a cautious eye. I will let you know if that's not the case. And you let me know, if you end up seeing it, what your thoughts are as well. But I will certainly see it in opening weekend and post a video on it. Now, just to talk a little bit about that first Incredibles film, I've already mentioned the ways it resonated socially, the way it recontextualized, my favorite word there, societal issues that were going on at the time, and it did so in a way that we could still draw meaning from today, as I said, living in the cultural heritage of those times. I'd like to do a brief visual analysis of just a few things in the film. You can start big picture and see that each family member is disparate, they're wanting to go their own way, they've got their own separate powers, and in the end they all end up in the same uniform, still maintaining their individual abilities, personalities, and so forth. That's significant. But the visuals I'd like to discuss take place when we see Bob Parr in that suburban life that he's so unhappy with. I love the fact that we constantly see him squeezed into spaces, squeezed into his cubicle at the office, squeezed into the car, squeezed into his dining room table even, this is a man who's being forced into a position that he doesn't fit. 
He's not comfortable in. He's not able to stretch out. He's even himself physically out of shape. That's significant. This is how the visuals echo and reinforce the points of the story. And that's what a film should do. If it's going to be a film and not just a story on the page, then the visuals have to work towards the whole effect as well. And it does this perfectly. If you move to the scene in which Bob's boss calls him into the office, this is a wonderful scene. Sean Wallace is the voice of the boss is just perfect. But you see Bob, as I said, he's been crammed into all of these spaces and he goes into the office and sits down in this chair. And once again, the visuals are telling you how confined he is, how restricted he is. The boss is talking about clockwork, things organized. And the boss on his desk before Bob, he has one of those desktop calendars with lines. Lines look like a prison. And Bob is sitting right across from that. Just to reinforce that visual, the boss takes these pencils that he's sharpening and lays them out on top of the lines on the calendar. Again, reinforcing this idea of bars that are in front of Bob Parr. He's stuck. He's trapped. He's squeezed into the confines of this life that he's unhappy with and unable to truly be himself with. Well, then what takes place in that scene? Bob sees somebody being mugged out in the alley. And he wants to go help him, but the boss refuses to let him. You must stay here. You must submit to my authority. You must continue to fit into this small box we want to keep you in. Bob refuses. And what does he do to refuse? He takes the boss and throws him through a wall. He breaks down the walls. This is Bob stepping out of this role, stepping out of this job. He doesn't know what's going to come next, but he can no longer fit into this box. So he literally breaks the box. He takes the boss and throws him through the wall. Brilliant. Brilliant visuals. Subtle, but if you think about them, and if you have an eye for this kinds of thing, they reinforce what's going on in the story. And even if you don't catch it on the conscious level, your subconscious is going to work to deepen the meaning of the story from those visuals. And honestly, I could go on and on. There was so much other great stuff in the film. I might come back and make another video and just analyze some more scenes like that, because there's just so much great stuff. But I don't want to make this video a half hour long post. So I will stop there. Again, I just wanted to draw attention to some of the aspects that made that first Incredibles film such a beloved, timeless classic in the superhero genre, in the children's film genre, in the family movie genre, whatever. It's one of my top 10 favorite films, period. So it, it was a great one, and, and it, we were right to expect and to hope and to long for a sequel to live up to it, especially after having waited so long for a sequel. We have all the right people returning, the directors, the talent, and so forth. So people are right to worry a little bit that maybe this isn't going to live up, especially when the climate that we live in today and the type of stories that we're often cheated with today, which end up being a little more than social propaganda. But again, I have my reasons that I hope I've stated clearly enough for thinking that that's probably not going to be the case here. I will definitely tell you if I was right or wrong. We're still closing in on the 1,000 subscriber mark. I'm excited about that. Thank you to all who have shared, liked, subbed, and clicked that bell for notifications and so forth. As we grow closer to the 1000 mark, I would like to know what graphic novels or films you would like me to analyze in live streams, because I would like to do live streams where I can respond to questions or comments there live as we're going through some novels together or talking about some films together. So let me know some hero stories that you'd like to see covered. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.